Hey, everyone. Hey. It's so good to, yeah. Hi. So good to see you all again. And this is the time where we are all at home. Because in Singapore, there's a lockdown. We probably know. Okay, not a lockdown. <laughs> because I think your mic is a little bit muffled. Oh, it's muffled? Oh, dear. Um, so it's phase two heightened alert. And hopefully we get out of this jail by Monday next week. Anyway, um, you all again. Uh, I think hello, Jasmine. Hello. Hello. Hi. And hi to everyone uh, from the chat. And as we all know, you don't want to see our face. You want to see the face of our speaker. Uh, and it's coming up soon. But, you know, the usual ritual, we have to talk about some stuff. Um, and let's see what we have. Yep, uh, started, starting off with a quick introduction to developer space. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Google developer space, uh, I'm just here to give a quick intro. So um, we have a physical space in the Google Singapore office, but due to the pandemic, we moved everything online. So that's how we started our YouTube channel, which uh, most of you should be viewing this video from. Uh, yeah, so really excited to be hosting a big old development today. Um, yeah, and Julius and Wei Yuan are the organizers. So yeah, let's move on to the next slide. I'll hand the time back to both of you. Uh, so as always, a uh, big thank you and a shout out to all of you guys out there who are viewing right now and who have taken the time to look at our event, uh, share our event, you know, who have told your friend. And you're now with uh, all your friends today who are watching this event, you know, Thanks to all of you guys. In fact, we can see around, uh, I would say, 25 of you guys right now. So, uh, again, hi to all of you. Uh, and, yeah, we definitely love to connect uh, in terms of, uh, you know, if you have any feedback in the future in terms of what events that you want to see. So, yeah, you can definitely reach out at, uh, to us at that email in the screen over there. All right. So, uh, for those who have been following us for a while, some of you might have known that, you know, uh, for both of our organizers, Julius and myself, we mainly have been from you know, GDJ Singapore and we've been using that YouTube channel. But after spinning out this uh, different objective, uh, this initiative, we've actually also created a different YouTube channel so that we can house all our content you know, over there in one single place. So for uh, all of you that, you know, if you are interested uh, to look into the content that's more you know, within this area, not just within you know, the context of GDG Singapore, you can actually check out the YouTube channel you know, in the screen over there we have also, you know, we are streaming today's live stream over there to that channel as well. So you can also catch future live streams via that YouTube channel. Okay. And yeah, so social stuff is always fun. Uh, definitely, if you have not, you know, followed our activities, uh, would definitely very much uh, recommend that, you know, uh, visit our Facebook page. Usually that's where we share most of our interesting stuff. You know, a few weeks ago, Julius, uh, actually shared the uh, infographic you know, in terms of salary for engineering uh, engineers. So you can actually check that out. That one, that infographic was very interesting. Uh, every week uh, for, I think, around a month now, we've been posting like shots of uh, previous live streams that we did, you know, some of the highlights of certain parts of those events. So definitely check those out. You know, those are really, really inter interesting stuff. And also, you know, our live streams like this, we also share news like that on th those pages as well. Uh, and yeah, also, if you're watching from Facebook, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and all that fun stuff. Yep, and uh, for DevSpace events, uh, we also have our website and Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube channel. So uh, yeah, just putting out there, uh, remember to like, share, and subscribe. Uh, yeah, so you can support us uh, on our way to becoming YouTube influencers. Uh, yeah, but on a more serious note, uh, yeah, we do organize a lot of events with startup and developer communities. So if you want to um, keep updated with all the latest happenings, um, yeah, do head over to all these social media channels to keep updated. And yeah, so for today's event, uh, it's actually live in two of these locations, uh, the YouTube channels of GDG, uh, Singapore as well as uh, developer space. Uh, but for those who are actually, you know, watching from, uh, like, you know, just now we mentioned our uh, big old YouTube channel, as well as maybe from Facebook, you might actually see uh, developer space as well as uh, big O's uh, Facebook page, right? There's actually a very interesting story behind it. So maybe we'll share that in a you know, Facebook group in the future, uh, if you want to hear about it. 
Uh, but yeah, you know, we're, we're trying a very interesting technology to uh, stream to multiple places at once. And yeah, as always, you know, for all events, we like to highlight that, you know, we are always looking for speakers. And this is not just speakers for, you know, Big O itself. It's also for, you know, GDG Singapore, uh, GDG Cloud Singapore and our sisters groups. Uh, if you're interested, you know, to be a speaker, you know, there's something you want to share with the community uh, in regards to, you know, certain Google technologies like, you know, web technologies on Chrome, Cloud with GCP, TensorFlow, Kotlin, Android, so on and so forth, uh, do check out that link over there. You know, we're always anticipating for uh, CFPs, you know, if to get you in as a speaker, you know, for our future events. And uh, as well, you know, usually we like to talk about, you know, our future events, uh, you know, not just, you know, for today's talk itself. Next month, we're gonna be looking at a different event, which is developer productivity at scale, where we have Ken Wills from Yelp. So definitely watch out for that. We'll be sending out more details, you know, again, as mentioned on our Facebook page. So make sure you go check that out. Okay, back to me. So we are from Hubble. We are being paid by Hubble. And we are sort of like kind of getting sponsored somehow by Hubble. And if our employer is looking at this, wink, wink, we are happy to get more money if you're watching. Um, so yeah, so as you all might know already, if you have been following us, it's a um, construction tech company and it's constantly hiring. Uh, thank you, COVID, for that. Uh, but to, you know, on a more serious note, it's a rapidly expanding uh, company here in Singapore and we are hoping to get more software engineers to uh, you know, help us uh, scale faster. Um, as you all might know, Joe at Changi um, actually used Hubble to build some of the uh, stuff in Juwe at Changi. Uh, also, Razor HQ, they also use Hubble to build some of the uh, stuff there. Likewise, uh, Pongol Digital District, as you might know, 2024-2025 will see a massive change in Pongol area and they're using Hubble as well. So if you'd like to be part of, you know, uh, a group that kind of builds the future of Singapore and uh, Southeast Asia moving forward, uh, this could be a very interesting area of growth for everyone. Uh, we're looking for front-end, back-end, mobile, software engineers. We are looking for DevOps, uh, people who's interested in doing marketing and sales. Um, please do reach out to us if you're interested, uh, either in the comments or, you know, in the email that we have shared earlier today. Um, and, okay, we are now here to introduce Wayne. Uh, Wayne is from GitLab, as you all might know, the company is there. Um, Wayne, uh, interestingly, as you might have seen some advertisements out there uh, that talks about the average CEO reads one book a week. Well, apparently Wayne reads one book a week. So, you know, he's one of those quote unquote average CEOs. Uh, and and he, um, he takes a Udemy course once a month. So uh, apparently it can be done uh, and only Wayne can do it. <laughs> um, and uh, of course, like Wayne has been, you know, in GitLab for a while, uh, one of those, um, companies that uh, have been remote for the most part of uh, its existence. Um, so without further ado, uh, handing it over to Wayne. Wayne, so good to see you. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Um, really appreciate it. So yes, today we're going to talk about engineering, productivity, uh, metrics, and morale. And um, so, uh, and uh, thanks, thanks to uh, the Google Developer Group and Big O N and uh, everybody else who made this happen. So, so um, first, a little bit about me. Uh, Julius already mentioned, so I'm based in Atlanta, Georgia, in the U.S. Um, not too far from Florida. That's usually a landmark that people know. Um, I'm a, one of the directors of engineering at GitLab. Uh, previously, I was a director of engineering at a company that Dell acquired. Um, so 20 something years of experience in engineering, veteran of three successful startups, including GitLab. And um, I do read about a book a week, although it's slowed down a little bit lately. And I've actually, um, I I've, uh, I've slowed down in my Udemy classes, but uh, I'm still doing some on LinkedIn, but a little less intensive ones. So, and a little bit more about me in the bottom here. And feel free to reach out to me uh, uh, after, afterwards if you'd uh, like to. So uh, a little bit about GitLab. What is GitLab? So GitLab is the open DevOps platform. You can iterate faster, innovate together, and it's basically a single application for collaboration, visibility, and development velocity. 
So it is, it is uh, great at uh, source code management, at C, uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment, CI and CD, um, and around planning of engineering work, um, and actually not just engineering work, but other work, and around um, security of securing the code and monitoring for performance and doing uh, monitoring security and um, all sorts of different things. And it's a very, very expansive product that actually can um, uh, uh, meet the needs of not only the core developer, the developer's core needs, but also other needs as well. So um, I was a user of GitLab before I came to the company about two years ago, and I was very impressed with it. It's one of the reasons I came. So who and where are we? So we're about uh, 1,300 employees in 65 countries and regions. Um, we're also very transparent, so you'll see lots of links here. Um, and I'm actually going to click on some of them and shows. We're very, very transparent as a company, and um, meaning we, we, we distribute lots and lots of information publicly because it helps collaboration not only amongst our team members, but also with our customers, with our community contributors, and with the public, and it really makes us much stronger. Um, so we've been all remote since uh, close to the beginning, and we have zero offices. There actually is a physical office uh, address, and it's actually a mailbox drop-off uh, somewhere in San Francisco. So zero offices, all remote since 2015. And as I mentioned, it's an open source product. We get thousands of contributions every year from close to a thousand different people in the community. And um, so that makes it uh, stronger as well. So it's the people who use it, whether they're paid users or not, um, are, uh, are able to contribute and make changes to the product to improve it. Um, we've got our, uh, I took a little screenshot of our map here of where people are um, in the company. And uh, you can see we, you know, many, many different regions and uh, including, I look, I think there are about five or so, maybe five to 10 team members in Singapore. And I think actually around the same number in the Philippines. So that's great. So engineering productivity metrics, let me talk about those first. So first is we, you know, we have a, an engineering team. I think the engineering team is about 300 people roughly. Um, and the development team is probably 200 of that 300 approximately. And we are spread out again all over the world. We run, we have people in probably 20 different time zones um, in the development team. And my team, my portion of the development team, which is about 50 people, it's probably actually about you know, 12 time zones. So some people have no overlap in, um, in work hours. And that's just fine because we work asynchronously. We, we tend to, um, if we have meetings, which we do occasionally, but we don't rely on those, we record, we take really good notes before them, during them, and after them, so anybody can read them. And also uh, record them and either make them public or, make, or uh, just inside the company if that's more appropriate. Um, and, but we, we want to measure and understand and then work to improve our overall productivity. And different teams do it in different ways. Um, they can customize how they do it, but there's some things that are common across the entire team. And these are the three here. It's, it starts with per department and per team merge request rate, or uh, you might, uh, other, other systems call that a pull request rate. So it's how many changes are made to the code base or merged to the code base per team um, on a, uh, based on the size of the team and also then per departments. We look at it on a per department basis. So I look at that on a per department basis, my peers do, and then individual engineering managers who um, lead certain teams do that as well. So it might be, for example, um, that a team gets, uh, or seeing, you know, let's say, nine merge requests per team member per month. Um, so that means each, on average, each person is doing about nine per month. Now, different merge requests or pull requests can be different sizes, of course. And even ones that are smaller are not necessarily easier and take less work. So it's more the, the average over time and the trends over time that get a, you a feel for um, how productive the team is and how effective the team is. And also helps us understand how we're doing at iteration, which is one of our values is that we want to make very, as small as possible changes, not too small, but as small as possible changes. So those changes can be put in, can be tested, can be validated before moving on to the next thing. and also allows you to get feedback on them. So it also encourages team members to make changes smaller whenever, whenever they can um, and break it up into smaller pieces. So um, 
Another one is, and I'll go into a little more details on these. I'll, I'll, I'll go into this link, which is, which is a public link. Long, we look at also performance of the system. And we look at it in various ways. In engineering, overall development, being a part of engineering, we look at availability, like how many nines of availability do we have? And we look at overall performance and load on our systems and costs that uh, we host. Uh, we have, our, our product is both hosted in the cloud, actually we use Google for that, and then also customers can run it themselves. So when it's hosted in the cloud, we, we look at that. But development is directly responsible for longest contextual paint which is something we like to have our metrics, things that we can control and impact rather than things that we don't indirectly can impact and then being responsible for it because that doesn't feel good if you're, and you're not that effective, if you're responsible for things you can't influence. So longest contextual paint, LCP, is um, how long it's taking a page to, it's a, it's a page load measurement that's very specific about when does the paint, when does the page actually show to the user? And we collect this in various ways and we track this on a per page basis and across the system. And then if we see something spike up or see something that slowly increases over time, it creates um, uh, backlog work for the, uh, uh, for the teams to work on it. And lastly, the other uh, metric is, um, and this one I didn't put in here because it's not overall engineering, but the third one, and I'll mention a fourth in a second, is review to merge time. So when developers make a change, they make a change, they test it themselves, they update their test cases, then they put it in for review or someone reviews it. And then a owner of the code base, a maintainer of the code base or that portion of the code base will review it, give them feedback. And then once it's ready, merge it. And we want to measure the time it takes when the developer fi finishes the work and gives it to the reviewers and maintainers to when it's merged. And the reason for that is that that talks about our productivity and time from when a developer completes to when that feature is available in production for our customers. It also gives us a feel of how many maintainers do we have? What is the load on the maintainers? We also have maintainer specialties in various parts of the code base. For example, we have a front end maintainer group. We have a back end maintainer group. And then we also have a database maintainer group. And then we have some others that are a little more uh, specific. And depending on the type of change, it'll need review based on those different um, groups. And it really helps us understand the overall productivity. What I'll do here is I'm going to go um, click on this. So again, this is all public, which is nice. Um, and you can see some of our um, you know, development department MR rate, longest context, largest contextual paint, uh, MR age, so the uh, the age of the open. Uh, Merge request. So you can see, for example, here, development department MRA. So this is for the development department overall. Our goal is to get to greater than equal to 10. And that is a bit of an aspirational goal, but we're working hard to get there is, uh, we raised it to 11 for a while and we reduced it back to 10. So you can see overall, for example, in um, May, we were at 7.5 roughly. And um, maybe back in um, a couple months ago, we were a bit higher at 8.5. So we were looking at this going, well, how do we get it to 10? It is a lot higher than it was in the past. So I can make this a little smaller so we can read this. Um, you know, back here in August of 2019, it was five and a half. So it's something we, cont we continue to work on and uh, look at. The, and each team and, um, has their own rate as well. So this is, for uh, my manager, Christopher, this is for the entire development group. I have one for me specifically for each department that I'm responsible for, so I can affect change to those. And I'm also, and then each uh, engineering manager that reports to me or on my teams also has one for them as well, so they can look. So some of my teams, for example, are above 12, and that's great. And some are closer to this average of, of, of uh, six or seven, and they're looking at ways to break things up further and improve it. Um, so uh, largest contextual paint. Um, you can see our goal is to be at 2.5 milliseconds or less. And you can see uh, back in uh, April, we were a bit higher than that, 4,000 seconds. People did some work. We had some gap in data here. But then we got below that, two and a half seconds, um, two, or 2,500 2, milliseconds. And there was a problem here in, in May. Uh, this this first week of May or this week of May here, and we've gotten it back under. So this allows us to see that and look at the details. Um, the MR age is another good one. So this is the um, 
what is the age of uh, merge requests authored by our development department and how long have they been out there? So this is the median days open. So you can see we don't want things to be open more than 30 days at, at, at a, the very high side. You know, generally things get merged in, in closer to, I believe it's seven days. You can see it's, it's actually started to go up a bit. It was below this for a while and now recently. So it's something that we're looking into is why has it gone up, et cetera, and looking at the trends, are they getting worked on and then fall to the wayside and then people forget about them? Are there ones that are not mergeable at all and, and we need to look at why, et cetera? So all sorts of good things there. Um, I'm also going to go into the growth one here to show a little bit more. Let's see if I can find it quickly. I'll, I'll find that later. So I was going to go into a specific team one, but these are the um, these are the primary uh, things that are used across engineering. In terms of um, the other one that often teams use is a say do ratio, where the teams look at this is the number of of um, either it's it's either by number of issues that uh, that are being worked or you know items of work that are that are being done per. Uh, per release, and we do we do production releases multiple times a day to our .com service, but we do um, releases to self-hosted customers on a monthly basis. We've been doing that for many, many months in a row, I think multiple years worth of months in a row every month. And um, we look at it on those um, monthly milestones. We look at either the number of issues resolved during that time period or the weight, the total weight of those issues. I think different teams do it different ways. And we, we aim, many teams aim between a 70 and 80% say-do ratio. They say they're going to do this amount, um, and they actually do a little bit less generally because we don't want um, them to uh, hit 100% because it means they're working too hard to get to that exact thing they committed to. They might be working extra hours outside of work, which we don't want to do, or they may be lowering their expectations to meet it. So we also don't want it to be really low either, you know, where you're saying you're going to do you know, this amount and you do this amount. Um, so that's why we look like a, a 70 to 80% say – to do ratio looks good as well, generally, in terms of um, predictability and expectation setting. Other parts of engineering, um, again, which development is part of engineering, are uh, mean time to close issues by severity and type. So how long does it take us to resolve issues? You know, the highest severity issues we want to get resolved faster than secondary than the tertiary. And also by type, we have different types of issues different types of expectations for quality issues versus security issues, et cetera. Average pipeline runtime. So when a developer commits code, the pipeline takes a certain amount of time to run before they get feedback. And that pipeline includes both building the code, uh, running tests, deploying it to a test environment. We want the developers to get feedback in, in a reasonable amount of time. So if that pipeline runtime, let's say people add a bunch of tests that take a long time, if they Average runtime goes up and the developer doesn't get feedback quickly, which hurts morale, but also hurts productivity. So we keep an eye on that. We also look at merge requests by type. Um, so how many merge requests are being done that are features that customers see that are bugs, uh, that customers may see or users may see technical debt where people don't see it, but help us improve in the future to, and make us more efficient in the future. And also merge requests by community contributors. So the number that are being done, not by GitLab team members or, or employees, but by um, the community. So, I'll, so these are just some of the engineering metrics overall, um, different than the other page I brought up. Um, and you can see there, there's many different ones. You can see merge request right here and how we classify things, et cetera. So how we do it doesn't necessarily apply to how everyone would do this, but um, it's, it's a good example at least to, to, to think about. So how does this impact morale and how do we keep an eye on morale? Um, the first is we do Again, since we're spread out over such a large number of time zones and countries and slash regions, um, we do things both synchronously and asynchronously. And what I mean by that is, is that we, we rely on async first or asynchronous communication first, where the preference is for developers to start with a merge request, whether that's a merge request to the code, 
a merge request to our handbook on how we operate, the company handbook, which I was just showing a portion of, to issues that track you know, those merge requests and uh, just to have discussions um, and put it in writing. And put it in writing knowing that others may have low context, meaning they may not know everything that you know. And it really helps us get more feedback from many different people, whether they're on a specific group or not, whether even whether they're even an employee or not. And it makes it very inclusive to get that feedback from those larger groups. And then we will do synchronous discussions as well, because sometimes you still need to do those to build um, to build camaraderie between team members and to make decisions where it's not obvious uh, where or where there's significant disagreement, which does happen. Um, so then we'll do Zoom um, uh, calls on that, and we take notes before them. We take notes after, or sorry, during the meeting and after. So as people are talking, they're also typing, or they're typing ahead of, in, a, in a future agenda item. And we also record them. We also put those videos either online in the public, if we can, which we can very often, or internally, so people can read the notes, they can participate, even if they don't, they're not able to make the meeting um, because it doesn't work for them for whatever reason. You know, it's not a good time of day or they have uh, some things to do at home at that time. Those are all uh, great reasons to not attend. Um, and it allows them to read it, to participate, and then also watch the video where you can get the emotions behind things um, because not the, the written doesn't always, that doesn't always um, come through. But it really helps quite a bit to keep people up to speed and to have a very inclusive environment to get people um, engaged. Um, we always try to explain the why, not just the what. And this is really important to me in my career as well is often um, it's easy for people leaders to just tell people what to do. And that's important, but if you don't include the why they're doing it, the people don't feel connected to it. They don't know um, that, you know, how does it impact the customers? How does it impact other employees or team members? How does it impact the company's revenue? How does it help out, you know, um, how does it help the people involved? And if you, if you always explain the why in addition to the what, people get really engaged on things and then they also um, find better ways to do it often, very, very often. If you just tell them, you know, please build this feature where it you know, has this button on this screen and this button on this screen and they are connected in this way. That's an okay what, perhaps. But if you don't tell them why, well, the reason we're doing that is, is that it streamlines the workflow and makes it so that there's fewer errors that users see when they're doing, let's say, a purchasing um, uh, uh, action. You say, ah, that, and tell them, well, that, that impacts not only our, our customers' um, morale, uh, but also impacts our revenue. If you explain the why, just not the what, it really helps. Um, per team, we do release re retrospectives, we, um, what went well, what can be improved, et cetera. We do this monthly on a per team basis, and then we take the most impactful and broad reaching ideas from those and do a, a all, com well, all engineering retrospective. These are very popular. Again, we do them primarily asynchronously, actually in an issue. Um, we do it, uh, many teams do a daily virtual standup since we don't share time zone. Not everybody shares time zones where they work at the same time. Um, we'll do this in Slack sometimes with uh, some various uh, Slack-based bots that will tell people, hey, it's time to say, what did you do yesterday? What are you going to do today? And are you blocked on anything? Um, some teams also actually move to do that in issues where they do that either daily or weekly, and that works really well versus a, a, a quote-unquote stand-up, physical stand-up meeting. Many teams do weekly social calls. They're optional for everyone, but just talk about pets and family and did they go to the park yesterday and what video games they've played recently, et cetera, which is great at synchronous. Um, we also do social channels per team in Slack, which are great. Just post the same kinds of things, but people would rather do that in uh, written and post pictures and things like that and talk on video. We also, and these, these are a lot of fun, do quarterly social days where it's a day, not a meeting, um, because we operate on so many different time zones. And we'll do some synchronous things there and asynchronous. So. Um, some of the teams via synchronous, you know, where people can get on at the same time, they've made food together. Everybody's going to make pizza at, you know, uh, this particular day. And then they'll, they'll cook together, which only works if you're in the same time zone. Or we're going to play an online game together for an hour. And, you know, um, and people really enjoy that. In terms of uh, um, async, we've done these things where people actually do online games, but where it's turn-based, like putting together a puzzle an online puzzle, or uh, one team did a show me your house, 
where people actually took a video of just walking around the house and giving a tour of their house and their kids got to wave or their, and you know, their significant other got to wave or they showed their garden, et cetera. Just like 30 second to one minute videos. And those are really popular to get to know people. So all sorts of things are done there and lots of great ideas. Those are just some of them. Per leader, um, people leader, we do um, quarterly managers skip level. So um, where I make sure I do, um, and this is a very common at GitLab, is I meet one-on-one -on -one with the the people who report to the people who report to me. So not with my managers who I meet with uh, weekly, but with their people. Um, and I we talk about what's going on and I let them know to always reach out to me, not just quarterly if they'd like to, but it ends up being great conversation about how things are going, what's getting in their way, et cetera. And also I do about um, uh, every two months and ask me anything in AMA session or also known as um, office hours where it's optional and I invite the entire, my entire team of 50 people. Um, I do it at different times of day to make it for good for different time zones. And people can ask questions uh, uh, asynchronously, you know, in a, in a doc, but also in real time. And people will ask me about how things are going in a project. They'll ask me about personal things and it's great to really connect with the group. Um, and I also invite stakeholders of the team to these as well, such as product managers and the UX team, the documentation team, and anyone else who's interested. Um, Company-wide, we do twice a year net promoter score measurement, um, which is great. And like one of the questions is along the lines of, would you recommend GitLab to a friend or colleague to work here? Um, and then they rate it uh, one to 10. 10 means absolutely, one means absolutely not. And we actually measure this and the way net promoter score works is um, if it's a nine or 10 rating, it's counted as a promoter. And then I think if it's um, uh, six or below, they're a detractor. And then those ones in between are neutrals. And you basically take the number of people that were a promoter and the number of people who are a detractor and then subtract the detractors from the promoters to get a feel for net promoter score. Um, and it's a very good, there, there are good ways to do this. And there, there, there's some challenges with net promoter score in general, but it works really well to get feedback. And then you ask them why, why did you say that? And you go into more detail, but it's a great way to get company-wide feedback on the morale. And also we have Slack channels across the company on, on common topics of interest, movies, pets. There's one that I participate in about um, space. So whenever there's a, you know, a, a SpaceX launch or a launch, um, by a uh, government or company uh, that is being broadcast online. We like to talk about it or some interesting things. So that's just something that I like. So the combination of these things allow people to get solicit feedback, to, to provide it when they have it, to have leaders solicit to get that feedback so they can act on it, to monitor for the morale overall and really get buy-in from the team members that these are the way things are, but we can improve and we can um, and put them in charge of that so they have the ownership and they can actually help it improve as well. So all remote, I know I've harped on this a bit, but that's, uh, I think that's okay. So we've been remote since the beginning and I was remote most of the time at the previous company I was at for, for uh, quite a few years. GitLab really takes it, took it to a new level. And this is back in 2015 uh, approximately when the company started this around around the same time it was founded. So we um, hire people, as I mentioned, all over the world. Not We don't have a central location. It's not like we have, you know, 50% of our folks in North America and the other 50%, maybe 40% in Europe and 10% elsewhere. Many companies work that way. Um, we are spread out all over the place. And we also have flexible working hours, over set working hours. So sometimes people will work, um, we don't want people to work extra hours. They want to have a great work-life balance. But some, for example, they work in the most work in daylight hours in their, you know, uh, during weekdays. Some, somebody who uh, used to be on my team is now on another team, um, has some very young children at home. And what he likes to do is he works early in the morning and he's in Eastern Europe. He works early in the morning his time before his wife and kids get up. And then he takes off in the middle of the day. He works about three hours in the morning he takes off in the middle of the day for about six hours while they're up and very active. And then later in the day, he works in the evenings. And that's not for everybody, but it's something that really works well for him. And I'm so glad that you know people are able to do things like that because we work asynchronously. 
We write down and record knowledge over verbal explanations. Verbal explanations are not are great, but not scalable. And sometimes they're still needed when people are stuck or need extra help, but they d definitely do not scale and are not inclusive over a large number of people over a period of time. Um, what I'd say as well is we try to have, and it's not written here explicitly, but we try to have a single source of truth that's in other handbook changes or SSOT, is we try to not document things in more than one place. It seems a little uh, uh, non, why would you do that? You know, how would people find it if it's not multiple places? The challenge is if it's in multiple places, as it changes over time, it gets out of date and you have to know where all the places are to update and know who should be approving changes to that, et cetera. So trying to get it to a single source of truth really, really helps uh, communication. Um, and having great uh, search capability, such as using, uh, we have a search capability inside the Get Live Handbook. I use that often. I also use Google itself since, it's since the handbook is public and many, many of our issues and merge requests, not all, but a large portion of them are public. I can actually use Google to search to find information about GitLab um, to do my job. Written processes over on the job training so people can learn at their own pace. Though we still do on the job training, but we do that, we do written processes as our preference. Public sharing of information over need to know. Um, this is really a game changer, in my opinion, especially from uh, where I came from, from a company which was did, due to work in security, really needed to be, have do things that, on a need to know basis. GitLab does not have that same need. And since we do things public publicly, we get feedback from um, not only team members, uh, employees, but customers, from users of our open source product, from just the general public. And it uh, gets a lot of, great interest in the company, we get a lot of great feedback, and it's also, and I wasn't necessarily expecting this, it's a great recruiting tool. People can see how we operate as a company before coming here. Um, we open up documents for editing by any, anyone. So our default is when we have a document or an issue or merge request is to make it uh, editable, not just viewable, editable by anyone at the company. Um, and that really helps um, to get feedback from many people. And I'm, I'm, I still, after being at the company nearly two years, I'm very pleasantly surprised how people that you didn't even know were interested in, in a topic are commenting on it and have great feedback on it. But if you didn't open up those documents and make it okay for anyone to comment on something or edit something, you don't get that. I mentioned asynchronous communication, the results of work versus the hours put in. Like for example, we never celebrate when people work extra hours. That is not that is against our values. We don't want to. It happens sometimes. And we're okay with it if it happens very occasionally, as long as people have a good work-life balance. But it, if it's the norm, that is, that is, or it's more than occasional, that's definitely a big problem. So we, we focus on the results of the work, not the hours put in. And uh, formal communication channels is we, 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 so what does that turn into versus informal? So we, for example, shy away from uh, private Slack channels and also from pri uh, Slack direct messages. Um, even with groups of people, because it makes it non-inclusive of others who may have interest or ideas about something. And um, it took me a little while to get used to this when I first came to the company due to this public sharing of information over need to know. But again, it really helps to bring people in. They understand what's going on. They're not assuming people often, if they don't have information, they'll assume the worst. So if you, if you provide it, even if they don't really care that much, occasionally they will. And it really gets buy-in and reduces... Uh, team member, you know, employee stress, et cetera. So there's a great guide on all remote um, that you can download that um, has gotten a lot of great feedback. We made that public. So this is just a summary of some of it, but I would definitely encourage people to do that. And uh, lastly, we are hiring an engineering, you know, just like uh, Hubble is and, and others. So we, um, on my teams, we're looking uh, currently for Ruby on Rails developers. Um, that's primarily what GitLab is written in, though a good bit is written in Go as well. And of course, um, uh, front end is, uh, has different skills, including Vue, uh, Vue.js. Um, my teams and many teams are primarily looking in development for Ruby on Rails developers, again, anywhere in the world. Uh, engineering managers, we're also looking for customer support people, site reliability engineering, security, user interface, user design, documentation, and many other teams. I know our product management team has a number of open uh, positions and sales and marketing, et cetera. So um, we're, uh, we're hiring and you can see the, the link here on where to go to see what kinds of jobs there are that are open. And what I'd say is um, if you have any questions for me, 
um, you know, now I'd, I'd love to hear them or comments or feedback. And also feel free to reach out to me if there's a role that you see that you want, you have questions about, um, or you just want to reach out to talk about things. But with that, that is what I was planning to present today. And as I do that, I'll put up the slide again on how to contact me, which is here. Nice, super cool. Wayne, thank you so much for your presentation today. Um, it's the first time that we had someone present to us about um, engineering productivity. Um, and it's, uh, I, I, su I suppose when you look at the questions already, it's starting to fill up. And of course, like folks, if you have uh, any questions, right, please feel free to uh, ask it in the live chat as well. Uh, so to kick things off, we do have uh, quite a bit of uh, pre-submitted questions. One of the most abundant actually of all the events that we have. So let's kick off with uh, something along the lines of performance evaluation. So one, one person asked, um, so how do you correlate all the metrics that you have with how you evaluate your engineers? That's a great question. And it's very, um, um, and is my audio still good? Uh, yes, yes okay, great. So, um, so um, thank you. The, um, we do not look, so the first one, you give an example, MR rate. We do not look at a per person merge request rate. Let me repeat that. We do not look at a per person merge request rate. Um, that um, creates challenges with, um, one, it's not fair to do that. And also it creates challenges where then individual team members fail to uh, micromanage and encourage you to do the wrong things. So we look at it on a per team basis, per department, and then per um, per sub department, and then per department basis to look at the overall trends. And um, so, the um, if a if a team's MR rate is lower, it might be the team is doing spike work of investigating things. You know, you don't end up with a lot of merge requests when doing investigations. Or it might be they're working on a big change that they can't break up further that they feel they can't break up further. And that's actually a good thing is like, this change ended up being, I know you don't like looking at lines of code, but let's just say most merge requests are probably, again, let's just say 100 lines of code per merge request. If you see one that's 1,000, that might be okay in terms of how it's being broken up. It might not be. It just might be, it can't be broken up further. So it's a good, it, it allows you to ask questions. Like, could we have broken up this further? Or is the scope of the change we're asking for too big? Or could we put feature flags to hide certain portions of it until they're ready so you don't have to do it all of it at once? Um, so the productivity metrics um, are um, influence the leader's performance review, not the individual contributors, not the engineers. So. Um, and it's not, oh, you know, person manager X, your merge request rate for your team is at seven and we want it to be 10 and that's really bad. No, I don't do that. It might be, hey, it was at five before, six months ago, and you've got it to seven, that's great. Come up with a plan to get it to nine or whatever. And then come up with action items to say, here's the things like we're gonna do iteration better, or we're gonna, I'm gonna work with these five people that are newer to the company and, um, have their their changes end up getting um, more feedback from the maintainers in these areas. Like they're not good at, my team is not good at database performance, let's just say, or, or they're not good at maintaining this part of the code base. So that's really where it comes in, is looking at it um, at a per team layer and then the managers being responsible and then really being servant leaders and supporting their team to get there. So um, now if, if a team member's if a team's merge request rate is low or than you want it to be, you can also look at is a team member, um, it might be that a team member is on vacation. You know, that makes sense why their rate would be low or they went to training or it could be they're having a problem at home. So it actually starts nudging the question of not that it's a problem, but that it's, it's something to, um, to investigate, or let's say their merge request is really high. That's not necessarily, let's say, you know, one team member, let's say the average for the team is 10 and one team member is at 20. It might be that they had a large number of small changes and, and that's great, or it might be that they're working extra hours because they don't feel confident in their job and they not having a good work-life balance. And, you know, it could be either, it could be those or other things, so it, but you don't know just looking at the numbers, it's really, it's asking the team member. It, it starts, it's a, 
way to have an idea of signal to start a conversation, but it's not, it's just the start of the conversation. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much, Wayne. We have another question, uh, also pre-submitted in, uh, and related to the, uh, somewhat related to this first question. So what are the challenges that uh, your team has faced when you are gathering data and how do you enforce of productivity through these metrics and practice? That's, a, that's another great question. So with, get, um, with get, gathering the data is, you definitely don't want to do it manually. You want to do it with an automated system. And we do that. We, we pull the data out of, um, some of it's using the GitLab features itself to measure these things. And sometimes we pull the data out of GitLab with APIs, with GraphQL based APIs and put it in a data warehouse and do trending. So for example, that graph I was showing was data pulled out of GitLab, I believe with GraphQL APIs, pulled into our data warehouse and then showing in our, um, our, our, our analytics tool. And um, you want to automate it and standardize it across teams. Um, and then if it's not right, don't have, don't allow, discourage each team from creating their own versions of it. Because then it becomes, you can't, it creates a lot of extra effort. You'd rather fix some of the challenges. So one, one for example is we decide which projects are included with the MR rate and which are not. If it's part of the product, it's part of the team MR rate. If it's not part of the product, it isn't. Sometimes it's really obvious, sometimes it's not. For example, handbook updates on how the company operates are not part of the product. They're not counted in the MR rate. But documentation changes are because they're delivered as part of the product. And then there's some like offshoot projects, like there's a demo project the customers use to, to, to a template project. Is that part of the product or not the customers use? And you know, it's a judgment call. So instead of having like each team create a custom version of it, we've standardized it. And then we we also acknowledge that it's sometimes not 100 percent accurate, and that's okay. We don't beat up a, a team if their metrics don't look good. We, we there's always the context behind it on what is accurate, what isn't, and for the things that are accurate, they want to improve, what are they looking to improve? So to enforce measurement of productivity and practice, it's this standardization, and it's making the team aware of them, all the teams, including the individual team members, and why. Um, like when we explain why do we measure a narrow MR rate, uh, narrow is uh, per team, so we call it, and not, not including um, community contributions, but, um, uh, but just the uh, employees or team members, is that it's, how we see how we're doing on iteration. We, we want to, we tell them, and also our customers look at this. They really, we, we got um, feedback from a customer um, that I saw about a week ago saying, it's awesome, every month you guys, uh, you, you guys at, you, uh, at GitLab, you team, you team members at GitLab, you're producing so many features every month. And it's great, and like some of them we don't care about, right? Because we don't use them. Or we, maybe we will in the future, maybe not. But we have all these features coming out every month, and our our MR rate really helps. Our performance data really helps to to make sure we keep uh, our eye on those goals as we grow as a company. Because the company has grown quite a bit uh, over years, and we don't want to lose our culture of being able to do these things. So it's it's explaining the why on the productivity metrics, and it does take some. You know, my manager. Uh, will remind me, and he runs all the development. Hey, make sure you're looking at your MR rate monthly, at least. And then I remind my team, if they're not doing it, I'll remind them, like, hey, you're at this, and you it's gone down a little bit over the last few months. What are the reasons behind that? Please investigate that and, you know, look into it, et cetera. Um, and it, it uh, we often also use these metrics and tie them to objectives and key results, or OKRs. Um, when appropriate, so that they're company-wide distributed and people really understand, like, here's the objective and then, um, like, improve MR rate for my team by 20% or something like that by taking three actions that the manager determines what they are. And then the, the results will be not only the MR rate as it changes from month to month, but also the specific actions. Has the manager come up with those actions and have they done them? And that, that really helps as well. I have a mini question, uh, more for, for, the, for the first part of this uh, question. So as a user of GitLab, uh, I think uh, I was very interested when you mentioned that we're using some APIs, uh, public APIs, uh, for getting the information back. I think you mentioned about MRE. Is this something that's available for GitLab users today? So uh, the, developers at, so is it going to, the developers at GitLab, do they use the APIs themselves? 
Yes, like yeah, can companies actually do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we use it to build the product itself. Um, and we used to be primarily REST-based APIs, and there's still quite a bit of REST there, but we moved to GraphQL and it really, they're, they're, it gives a lot of flexibility, which is great. Um, it allows us to do many things. It does sometimes, you know, GraphQL with, with great flexibility comes great performance and security challenges sometimes. So we have to keep an eye on those. But overall, it's been a very, very positive experience. Awesome, thanks. Um, Wayne, I think earlier you were sharing that all of the employees, they have access to edit the documents and all. Um, just wondering, are there any horror stories of new employees coming on board and, you know, they accidentally delete some super important files? Um, what, what best practices do you have to avoid this from happening? So it, there definitely have been times where somebody's made a change and then later regretted it. But we'd rather take those kinds of risks than it, to be able to have all the collaboration than not. And um, the it, it can happen to a document. It can happen to the code base. Um, so um, I'll I'll, uh, I'll, give, I'll give an example is the so we we will, we always do blameless root cause analysis after something that was very impactful and. Um, and then um, look at how to improve because it's generally, it's almost never the person. It's the, it's the technology and the process that the person used that is flawed, not the mistake the person made. So you do this blameless root cause analysis to figure out what happened and how to avoid. So, um, and it's also cultural. If you see it, call, call it out and be, be very forgiving, but also call it out. So um, an example of, um, like I was looking at a document for a meeting that was upcoming and I saw two items, one of them, which was an action item for me, one with somebody else and looked really similar. There's a one word difference. I, I missed the one word difference and I combined them. And then the person who owned the other action, I was like, what happened to mine? I thought I had to do something. And you know, they caught it like 30 minutes later. It was before the meeting. And I said, you know what? I'm sorry. Yep. I mean, it's like, oh, they said, no problem. And they, Good thing is they use the undo and then did it. They realized I made the change. That's how they knew that I combined them incorrectly. Or another example would be is um, you know, we roll out a change to production. Uh, so that's a change to the document. We roll out a change to production. Um, we have really good, mon we have great automated test cases that, that um, catch many things, but of course don't catch everything. We have great automated monitoring that use, you know, we use the GitLab product itself to monitor the performance of GitLab, which is uh, dog fooding as we call it, our own solutions. And we try to catch things here. We don't always catch it. So sometimes we have outages um, or issues, but we'd rather, and then we do root cause analysis to avoid the root cause of those in the future. Um, and so we can, and so we can roll back that change once we determine what the change was that caused it, if it was a change and then improve in the future. Um, uh, an example might be is that um, we rolled out a change in uh, where we started seeing um, user signups to the system have a higher error rate. And we have monitoring for that, which is great. So we saw this, we, it's not great that we had the problem, but about an hour after the problem started, it was something like, for, for a time period, it was maybe about 30 minutes, 10% of user signups were failing, when it was generally much closer to zero. So we saw this spike, but it, it, it was intermittent. And we couldn't fit, and we initially, so we declared an incident and figured out, we then looked at all the feature flags changed up to including because it was not obvious and found the one that did it. And it turned out it only happened on one browser and only a portion of the time, right? So it was, well, it was very intermittent and hard to determine. So we rolled back that feature flag and then the problem went away. And that team, we didn't, you know, throw that team under the bus that made the change. Like they said, oh, we now know what we're doing and now we know this, what can happen in these situations and we can improve in the future. And we have other changes coming in the future that are like this. Now we know how to avoid this particular situation. It was like on a certain old version of Chrome that's still very popular, you know, only, and only a portion. It was very, very, you know, uh, very small use case, but it, it was one that was hitting us. So, um, so we did that. We didn't throw that team under the bus. We, we learned from it. We documented it publicly and then we went forward from it. So great question. Thank you. So it so seems like, like Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry. Here in um, yeah, I think it seems like um, going to uh, 
yes, finding out how to solve the problem instead of um, directing it towards a certain team and blaming them for the issue. Uh, I think we have a slightly related comment uh, that came in. So Abel asked, um, I think you mentioned a lot about documentation. Uh, how does an, uh, maybe a new employee uh, navigate the treasure trove of documentation available? That's a great question. Um, thanks, Abel. Um, and the, yeah, it's, it can be information overload, definitely. And it's why we try to have a single source of truth for everything. We don't always succeed, but we, we definitely aspire to that. So things are only documented in one place. So you don't find conflicting information if it's not updated in all places. It's Google searching or searching in the GitLab product itself, um, whether it's the handbook or issues or merge requests. And then if you still can't find what you're looking for, ask it. And we've got a great culture of uh, a questions channel, for example, in Slack, where people ask anything. And um, often the same questions get asked. And then we, we start to do some root cause analysis over time. How do we document that better? And it, it's often, it's not always by new team members, but often it is, it's things you only have to do once uh, when you start at the company. Um, but it, the questions channel helps. The, we also, um, for new team members, and it's not just focused on new, but we give them an onboarding buddy where somebody they meet with periodically and they can ask questions, they meet with synchronously, you know, on Zoom, at least once a week, and then also can ask them questions. And we also surround them by a team like, how do I do X or where do I go to do Y? Or, um, and there's just so much to know. Um, it's, I've been to the company two years and I'd say my first two weeks, it's overwhelming. The, the, you get an onboarding issue and it's, I think it's a hundred action items and some of them take five minutes and some of them take five hours and you don't have to do all of them. You don't have to do all of them right away. But, and then look, every time I look at a handbook page, um, I go, okay, I want to read these other five handbook pages it links to it. And then I want to click on one of those and then I find five others. And then I've forgotten where I started when I'm 50 pages in. So it's, it's, it's bookmarking them, finding them, and then um, knowing you can't know it all and it's going to change, it changes often. So, and that's okay. Even today, I have that experience. I'll find some portion of some system. Like, I had no idea we were doing that. That's really neat. And I wish I would have known about that six months ago, but I do know about it now, which is great. Um, and, um, that's how we deal with it. It's definitely a challenge to have so much documented and so much communication going on, but it's better than the reverse of people not being informed. And, um, oh, we also do um, um, every, I think it's every three months, each department, uh, maybe it's a little more than every three months, each department will do a presentation to the rest of the company, which gets distributed, gets recorded, et cetera, and people can ask questions. And that helps as well as it's a summary of everything that's going on in that department. And I will, I actually rarely attend those, but I almost always read the notes and read the slides. So many people attend them. And I will actually put comments in there and questions, and that, that helps if I have questions. And when I read those, like if it's my boss's presentation, um, I read, I help to put together a little portion of it and I read the whole thing. If it's my boss's bosses, I do. If it's product management, which I work with closely, I do. If it's the CEO, uh, Sid, I do. If it's the legal team, well, I actually work with the legal team somewhat, I generally will be interested in one or two slides out of 20 that they'll present. But those one or two are really, really important to me. Like I get involved with open source policies at GitLab. Um, and uh, I've worked with that uh, quite a bit. And I'll read those again. And I found out about an initiative to improve our open source program. And I got involved because I read those slides. So that helps to bubble up to the top the most important things, at least to that team. And then you can figure it out from there. So that helps as well. And we call those um, group discussions. Thanks a lot. Good. Thanks, Fane. Uh, I think we have a question also very similar to what you have just mentioned which is about uh, recorded conversations, recorded meetings. Uh, and there could be scenarios whereby, you know, some of these uh, information can get leaked out of uh, GitLab, uh, you know, shared to public and so forth. Like, do you have any form of uh, defense against those? Yeah, that, that is definitely a great question. And so we announce when we're recording, and we announce when we're recording if it's going to be available to the public or internally. And we default to available to the public and then to publicly uh, inside the company. 
And, and same thing with, with issues and merge requests and documents, et cetera, is we have a list of explicit things that are not public. And as, if it's not on that list, it's okay for it to be public. And we distribute a lot of information publicly. Our product plans, what features we're going to, what, who's on which team, right? How many people do we have on each team? Uh, what are they working on? Um, what are our future plans for the product over the next three months, six months, year? Not only can our customers can see that, but our competitors can see that. And what we say is because we're so efficient in delivering on these things and on the execution of these things, that makes us so much better doing that. We're, we're happy to take the risks of competitors seeing what we're going to do and copying it. Um, we're happy to see that, take that risk because we're so much more efficient. Um, occasionally, we say something that's private that we can't, that we don't want to say publicly. And it's sometimes we like this is being done. We live stream some meetings too. So it's not being recorded and then posted later. It's being live streamed um, and people can see it live or watch the recording later. If that happens, which it does occasionally, we take it down. We either edit it after the fact or take it down. We're willing to take that risk. Um, and people will say in a discussion, hey, we might have 10 things on an agenda and two we can't talk about publicly. Um, because of our public uh, policies, people say, well, let, let's move that to the end of the meeting. We'll stop the live stream at the end and then cover it then. Um, that's another method we use, but we'd rather be more transparent and take those kinds of risks than not. And, you know, some of the private things are pretty important. Part of their, you know, active security issues we're working on. They're, you know, specific customer names. If, you know, a customer escalates an issue to us and there's a customer that, doesn't has not given us permission to talk about the fact that they use GitLab. We're totally fine with that. And they said that we don't want you to mention us. We won't. But occasionally they'll escalate an issue and then we'll talk about that issue in a group meeting saying, you know, customer XYZ has this issue. We say, oh, wait, we said we wouldn't talk about a customer name. So we just take that, we make that recording available internally only. Or another would be as um, when we have a candidate, uh, sorry, who's accepted a role at GitLab, we don't say their name publicly until they've actually started. Uh, until their first day, because we don't know when they've told their current team, their current company that they're leaving. And sometimes people, the day, it doesn't happen that often, the day before they're supposed to start, they change their mind, right? So uh, it happens, maybe only like 1% of the time, but it has happened. So until they actually start, we don't we don't say their name. We'll, we'll, often what we'll do is use their initials and their, their location to, and say, if you'd like to reach out to them, please do. Uh, you know, on LinkedIn or, or Twitter or whatever. Uh, but, um, you know, those are some of the examples of things that aren't public until the, the right time. We, we take those risks intentionally. So that, that's a great question. I have the same question myself is how, how do we how do we do this well and take those risks and take appropriate risks? So the questions that are being asked today are awesome. This one and the last one, too much information since there's so much information out there. I talk about that in skip level meetings with my team all the time. Like. How do you keep up with all the information? So the, the questions that the group are asking, they're awesome because they're things that we ask inside GitLab as well. Cool, thank you. And can I ask a follow-up question as well with regards to, you know, um, like some companies, they uh, have a special focus on like negotiating salaries, uh, which makes them unwilling to be open with, you know, uh, how much they pay people and stuff like that. Like, do you have a principle in GitLab whether you are open to your salaries or yeah it's we are uh, very transparent about that um about about compensation and the way it works is that the any team member can see the compensation bands for any role uh, or just about any role i think and uh the compensation details like people in sales different than people not in sales etc since they're not you know people in sales are generally quota based I, I believe at GitLab as well, but I'm not sure. Um, the um, and there's bands. There's basically this role in this region, in this in this geographic region, and then at this experience level. And you plug it in, um, and uh, both the current employees have access to that, and also uh, process, uh, people who are candidates. You, it's not public. We used to have that public, and it's not public public anymore. But anybody who's actually applied for a role and gotten past the initial screening can see those compensation bands, and to know uh, to know that both uh, you know sal the potential for salary, for bonus, and for stock options, they can see those, and that gives people a lot of um, um, confidence that they know where 
they would be or where they are, what the ranges are, and there's not this worry about, um, uh, um, of, I don't know what people are paid in a similar role as me, so am I being treated fairly? Because we're very, very um, adamant about these are the bands, and exceptions, I guess in theory could be made, but I, I don't know of many myself. And it's, actually, I don't know if I actually know of any myself, um, any exceptions made to those bands. And um, it really helps with the transparency. And it, it's, it's hard to be transparent about compensation, right? It, it's, it's often something that people don't want to talk about publicly, but we, 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 we try to make it as transparent as possible. And uh, we do, I think we do a pretty good job of that and it works well. Thanks, Reem. Okay, so we have another question. Uh, this is a pre-submitted question from a member of our audience. Right, so uh, he asked, uh, what's the best way to still have a personal connection with people given asynchronous work? How do we make asynchronous communication work in a fully remote team? Yeah, it's great. Um, to have a personal connection with people given asynchronous work is to, to do these, um, uh, one thing I didn't mention um, in the slides is, in addition to what I've already mentioned, is that we do these coffee chats, which is anybody is encouraged to do a coffee chat with anybody else in the company, which means you schedule 30 minutes, or actually we use the Google Calendar feature to make everything five minutes less, so 25 minutes for 30 minute meetings, people get a break, um, and schedule with people to, um, catch up on things and you might catch up on work or you might just catch up on personal things. Um, and everybody on a team is encouraged to do that with their peers on their team. And we also have something called the, uh, uh, donut be a stranger and actually spelled, I think it's D O N U T like the, the pastry donut do not be a stranger. It's a, a particular slack, uh, plugin or a, a app. And, um, I think they have it for teams too, but we use slack and, um, it's it randomly, if, if you choose to participate, and I, I sometimes do, I sometimes don't, every two weeks, it schedules you with somebody else who's in it to just have a coffee chat. And I will meet people in the marketing team or sales team or the recruiting team. And sometimes it's places I have very little knowledge of. So I, I, I met somebody the other day in Corsica. I, I had to look up on the map, where is Corsica? I just, I didn't happen to know. Um, and it was great to have a conversation uh, about about that and and talk about, I learned so much from those. So that, that really helps. And in terms of how to make async communication work in a fully remote team, it's, it, it's, it's a culture. And you have to kind of, you can't teach a culture, you can't just read about it, you have to live it. And sometimes you don't get it right. And then you get nudged in the right direction. Um, and um, that really helps. It, it's documenting everything. Um, and it's really weird for me sometimes to be t uh, talking and typing at the same time. But I really try to do that in meetings. I'm still not very good at it. Uh, I've seen others be really great at it, is I'll type a summary of what I'm saying as I'm saying it. Not every word, of course, not transcription, because then it, it solidifies what I'm saying, but also for notes later, I don't forget later for people who are reading it afterwards, it really helps if they're not watching the recording or it's not being recorded. That really helps and making sure in a discussion, you know, like, hey, people say, did we remember to record this? And sometimes we, we configure that automatically and reminding people to record it and post the recording where, hey, are there, is there an agenda for this meeting? Are there meeting notes? If not, can we add that right now? It's okay, we didn't add it, let's add it now. Let's distribute the notes later. Let's make that document open to the whole company, et cetera. Those are important things to um, to do. And it, it really does help. It is a challenge if everybody does it and everybody knows what the expectations are and they nudge people when they go off in a different direction, uh, back in the right direction, it works well. It's never a you know a hammer. It's more of a polite nudge back in the right direction. Um, and that really, really helps. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, small follow-up for the first part of the question. So this is also a little bit of something that I faced before, and I kind of want to ask uh, to get your opinion. Uh, also based off of like your earlier examples where you mentioned, you know, during the your sharing just now, uh, you have gatherings where you know, people just show like a three to four minute clip around their house or they show their pets and stuff like that. Uh, so what about for uh, co-workers who might be more introverted or they might not be as keen to share? how do you ensure that you still remain connected or the leads still remain connected to all of them? 
Yeah, that's a great question. How do you stay connected with more introverted team members? Um, is, 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 is a couple of different ways. Is some that are introverted like to do things in written uh, than in, in video calls when connecting with people. So they might post pictures from a recent, uh, you know, when they went hiking recently um, in a Slack channel. And often some of our, uh, most of our Slack channels are public inside the company. Some of the social ones are private because the teams felt they'd be more comfortable sharing with, you know, the 20 people in their group than with the 1300 plus people in the whole company, uh, some personal information, like, you know, showing pictures of the recent trip or, you know, pictures of their pets or kids or, you know, what they cooked for dinner that they're really proud of, et cetera, or something they, some hobby like they, you know, somebody put together a bookshelf that they made them, they cut the wood themselves. They're really happy about that. And they showed the process. So it's somebody who's doing it asynchronously for people who are more introverted. Another is trying to call them out in a discussion say, Hey, so-and-so we haven't heard from you today. Do you have anything to add? And sometimes that's all it takes. And sometimes they cringe and back away. And it, and so you kind of today take the cues being on video. Don't do that again. If, if they really pull back from it because it's not something they prefer, but sometimes they just, they're introverted, but if you ask, they have things to say, but they don't feel comfortable speaking up unless asked and, and calling them out and asking in a nice way, if they have anything to add is good. Um, another is like one of the people that actually did that video of their house, like they, um, we also did an online uh, game where it was, um, uh, uh, a version of Pictionary where one person draws. I think it, uh, I think it's called Drawsaurus. It's a free service. Like it's the, uh, and one person draws and other people try to type what they're drawing in a chat window and if they get it right, they get points. And some of the introverted folks really liked that. They didn't need to talk, but they were able to draw and guess. And later on, they said they really, really liked that team building activity. That's actually one of the most popular ones is Drawsaurus. There are other good ones too, but that one's a lot of fun. It's, it's silly, but it's a lot of fun. It's a great way to do team building. Thanks for sharing some of the experience in uh, this team building activities with your team. For sure, you can as well. Um, adding on to a few questions uh, about mode work. So I think uh, currently a lot of companies, um, they are all onboarding people remotely. So I think earlier um, in your presentation, when you were sharing that, uh, the past few companies you were with, they are also uh, remote, but uh, Git, GitLab took it to a new level. So uh, curious to know what are some uh, differences? Uh, yeah, like what, what are some things that really stood out? Um, and also for a lot of companies that are currently doing remote work, what do you observe um, that, what do you think they should be doing more of? Maybe like certain companies are not doing enough of uh, it's, it's great. It's a great question. Is it, it takes, we iteratively improve or iterate our onboarding process over time. Um, and we continue to, um, in fact, one of the tasks in onboarding is make a change to the onboarding template based on your experience with it and improve it in kind of the concept of everybody can contribute, which is one of our, um, one of our, um, important things at GitLab is that includes an onboarding of uh, the onboarding processes. So, um, it um, what's key is having the list of things to do, making sure people know when to do it, if it's optional or not, or it's be aware of this. Don't do this now, but be aware of this for the future and know, and letting them know where to go for help. And then also giving them an onboarding buddy. So it might be, if you have a problem with getting your first expense report paid, right? Or, or filed, right? Go to this group. And, and here's how you do it. Tag this group, put, you know, at and the group name in the issue, in the comment, in the issue. Or if, um, and then also giving them that onboarding buddy is really key. And also making it flexible. Like uh, I have a team member who started last week, actually part of a, a, an acquisition we did, who um, he doesn't have his laptop yet. So he's using his personal computer. And we're okay with that. We know that happens. Um, because we have to, he can't buy the laptop he wants in his town, so we have to ship it to him uh, internationally. Um, I think, uh, and so we're working on that. And he said, 
oh my gosh, it said on day two I'm supposed to turn on the encryption on my new laptop, and I don't have it yet. Is that okay? And he got, I could tell he got a little upset that he wasn't following. He's like, no, of course that's okay. Yeah, of course, it says day two, but it's fine to do it the, you know, the day or two days after you get your laptop. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things is I think that he might do in the onboarding template is say, is put a note in that item saying encrypt your laptop if you have your laptop. If you don't, delay this to a future day. Not that that's a huge deal, but it would have made him feel more comfortable that he couldn't do it even though he really wanted to. Um, and we also have individual groups that maintain their portions of the onboarding template. So, you know, uh, the people ops team, which, you know, helps with getting paid, uh, which helps with, you know, uh, getting configured to do expense reports, or it might be the security team where there's some required security training, or uh, the people team, uh, the diversity team, make sure we have some diversity training to make sure that people know that. And then there's other, and then there's engineering specific things and even group specific things. Like for my, for specific words in my team, just like, this is all great. Here's how you get a developer up to speed. But for this group, we want you to do these three other things too. Make a small change to the documentation in this part of the product or something like that. And making it custom per group, per department, and then for the company, I think helps and op optimizing it over time. And uh, I think it's, 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 it, was, it was really neat to see when I started, and I'm glad we saw that is there was an actual task for new team members, new employees, to improve the onboarding template as they're doing it, mm -hmm. which is great. Thanks a lot. OK, I think uh, we, have our, we probably have time for one or two more questions. Uh, uh, OK, there's one here. Um, I guess it's more about uh, experience in the industry. Uh, so, you know, in the industry, you have fresh blood, uh, fresh out of school, a furious experience, and then you have ancient fossils like me. Uh, so do you have, like, any thoughts around, you know, how productive they are and, like, any pros and cons that you have seen? Yeah, so this is another, this is just awesome questions from the group. Um, so... The more time someone has, more experience they have under their under uh, in in their in their career, the more times they've seen the patterns, which makes gives them a lot of knowledge of, in my opinion, the, the patterns that uh, that allow them to look more expansively or expansively or, or thoroughly over time to make to make good advice and decisions. So um, might be, for example, and, but then on the other side, the more experience one has, the more stuck in their ways they may be, or at least that might be the perception. Like they've done it many times, so they're, they're not as open to new ideas, perhaps, right? And, the, and somebody who's younger or has less seniority can also have great experience and great ideas for planning. So these are, these are just sometimes perceptions, sometimes misperceptions. But, um, so, but people who are, let's say, just out of school, don't have all these experience under their belt, but they've got, they're learning things fresh. They're learning things new and um, they may have more exposure to the latest technologies. So it's kind of a combination of those make for really strong teams. So might be, for example, um, and I've, I've seen this kind of pattern, both at GitLab and other places is a, um, engineer who's two years out of school, working with an engineer who's, let's say, 20 years out of school. And the engineer who's two years out of school um, used some technology that was invented five years prior in school. And it'd be really, really useful for a project. Um, uh, and then they bring it to the, uh, in a discussion with, uh, where it includes somebody who has 20 years, and that, that was a, hey, I've seen things like that before. Here, yes, this is a great tool, great technology. What are the pros and cons of it? What's the performance? What's the maintainability? And then the, uh, those might be unknown things. And you kind of take the combination of the new idea with the, what are the questions that you should ask as implementing that new idea? And the combination makes for a really strong team. Uh, if you just have one or the other, you can have those challenges. And... Um, but I'd say it's it's great to do mentoring of people with more experience and less experience, but I'm gonna add that it's better to do reverse mentoring of the people with less experience, but more 
uh, more recent experience on the latest things, often, not always, to bring that in as well. Uh, and I've seen some great, great books on that. Um, uh, for example, there was a, um, one by uh, somebody who is, I believe, an advisor to the CEO of um, Airbnb, who came from the hotel industry and had no technology experience, but knew hotels really well. This is sort of at the beginning of Airbnb. And he understood kind of the hospitality space really well, but didn't know about, uh, you know, at the time, I think they were mostly putting their ads on Craigslist, had no idea what Craigslist was, for example. And, but he was able to partner with people who really knew those things well and or grew up on them to say, well, okay, that's great. Teach me this technology and how it can be applied. And I'll tell you about my experiences and how that could potentially apply to this industry, et cetera. And the combination of that was really good. Oh, that's really awesome. Hashtag reverse mentoring. That's a good one. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, slightly related to, I guess, the last part of the answer where you mentioned about uh, books. I think to end off today's session, and also because Julius uh, introduced, when he introduced you, mentioned that uh, you have read uh, a lot of books like once a week. Uh, are there any books in particular that you would recommend to uh, people you know, in terms of uh, the topics that we've talked about today? Uh, I, I think you're on mute. Sarah, yes. And I'm actually looking for, I have, I keep a list of those and I'm looking for that as we speak. Um, the, you know, um, and I'll, I'll put it in the chat as well. Um, so it, uh, I put that in the private chat if somebody could repost that to the public one. So it's a couple different books. It's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Um, it's, it's a relatively old book, uh, before my time, but th there's been updated for it, uh, how to win friends and influence people in the digital age. It still applies today on how to get along with people and how to really, um, uh, collaborate with them. Um, some more recent things, the five dysfunctions of a team is a great book. Um, and it tells it as a story and then, uh, of specific people and then talks about the concepts behind it. I really enjoyed that one. And another uh, very specific engineering is the Phoenix Project, which is uh, about IT and DevOps and um, just a great book. It's also told in story form. Of, oh my gosh, this is a really big problem with this company. They're gonna go out of business. What do we do? What do we do? And then like how people react and how people uh, succeed or don't in those kinds of environments. It's a great book. And the, I think there's an update to it. There's the Phoenix Project and then another one, but it, I, I, I you could have swapped in companies that I've worked with in the past uh, and, and into the past and like, oh, this is, yes, I've seen these exact kind of patterns happen. That's a great one as well. So those are the three I'd recommend. Uh, to add on to that, I also recommend The Phoenix Project. It's a really awesome book <laughs> for those who are listening in. Really, really great book. Uh, for someone like myself, like I, I don't really like to read uh, books in general. That was a really good one. Like, as you mentioned, storytelling, it's a... Uh, Good book to get hooked on. I think I finished it within like two to three days. It's a really, really good book. Yeah, that's one of my favorites as well. Super cool. Uh, Wayne, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I know that it's very early morning uh, in your side of the world. And, you know, this, um, this event has been very, very productive for us. You know, we have learned a lot from you and actually we do have a lot of uh, prepared questions that we were not able to ask as well uh, but hopefully you know next time if you uh, want to join us again uh, we'd be more than happy to have you and uh, pick your brains and uh, uh, kind of learn more from you know, your experience and uh, uh, everything else um, once again thank you so much Wayne and um, hope you have an awesome day ahead Thank you. I really appreciate uh, inviting. I really enjoyed the conversation and I really enjoyed all the questions too. Great, great questions. So thank you, everybody. Have a great evening. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, and everyone, um, just to kind of close the night, uh, as you might know, we are looking for speakers. You know, uh, it doesn't have to be anything leadership related. We are more than happy to have you to, you know, submit your talks around Android, Kotlin, you know, Google I.O. has just uh, finished, right? So please do submit things that you want to talk about, things like Wink Wink, Jetpack Compose, or things that are new in Firebase, like 
uh, uh, what is it, UpCheck, for example, uh, things are on the web. We have uh, quite a bit of things to share, uh, likewise for Flutter. Uh, so please don't hesitate to uh, bring up uh, your tech proposals in uh, that link below, and we'll try our best to contact you as soon as possible once we see your submission. Uh, and of course, don't be uh, limited by, you know, like if you want to share something, it's your first time, we'll be more than happy to help you out as well. And of course, if you're a female speaker, you know, um, Jasin and Janice from uh, DevSpace, uh, they are hosting Women Developer Academy. Uh, it's going to start soon. Uh, and there's going to be uh, quite a bit of uh, sessions, I think, within the year, right? Uh, there will be multiple, multiple cohorts uh, for the year. Uh, so please uh, do sign up for that as well. Yep. Uh, thanks, Julius and Miriam, for coming on board as mentors as well and supporting us for, since, I think, cohort one. <laughs> yeah. Yay. Yeah, please do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then once again, uh, you know, we'd like to uh, keep in touch with you. Please do uh, visit our website, go to our Facebook page, like our page, follow our page so that you can uh, get updated with the latest news. Um, likewise, our new YouTube channel, uh, please do support us um, uh, by clicking on subscribe uh, if you're accessing us via YouTube. Uh, finally, in uh, next month, we will have Kent Wills from Yelp um, to help us, uh, you know, kind of figure things out around the developer productivity at scale. Uh, the topic will be similar to what we have seen here. Uh, and we're going to see, you know, like Yelp is, uh, as you might know, one of the biggest um, restaurant reservation and restaurant review uh, company in the world. Um, and so we're uh, more than uh, excited to have Kent next month. Uh, again, next month, it will be 10.30 a.m., uh, not the typical night, uh, 8 p.m., that, not typical, but like not today, 8 p.m. Um, it's 10.30 a.m. next week. Um, that's it. That's it. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a very good night. Bye-bye.